So today we're going to continue our series in the book of Mark, and we're going to be taking a look at some further lessons in chapter 9. Now, last week, if you were here, we, uh, we spoke about in the first part of chapter, Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 13, where Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and he was transfigured before them to reveal the true identity of who he was in power to those, those three disciples. So that was the setting. And after the transfiguration had happened, they had discussion, and they came down from the mountain, and uh, they, uh, they went to go be with the other nine disciples. So evidently, however, while they were gone... Something had happened. So as they approached the other nine disciples, there was a commotion that was taking place. So this is the setting for our message today. Would you turn with me in your Bibles or follow along if you would like on this overhead to Mark chapter 9, starting with verse 14. Mark chapter 9, 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them. And the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So here we have this setting. The nine disciples are having this argument with the teachers of the law, and this man is here with his son. And so G Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they rejoined the nine disciples, and there's a big problem at hand here. Evidently, this man had brought his tormented son to the group to see if they could help by driving this demon out of him that was hurting the boy, trying to kill this boy, but they couldn't help. And um, Jesus had become known publicly for performing great miracles. He, he was known throughout the region. So um, the people, when they saw Jesus coming towards them, they were glad when he arrived, and they ran to him to see if he could actually bring some insight into this argument that was taking place. And it doesn't exactly say what the teachers of the law were arguing about, but it was evident that the debate was revolving around the impotence of the disciples to be able to heal effectively this boy who was being hurt by this demonic entity. Evidently, the disciples were also befuddled and wondering what had gone wrong, what was wrong. Now, you know, there's been textual criticism on this particular passage with skeptics of the Bible saying, well, you know, there's this boy, and it sounds an awful lot like epilepsy, but this was not an epileptic seizure. This was a demonic seizure of this boy. You know, there, there's there been times where people have mistaken epilepsy for demonic possession, and, and that's not the case. But there is times where evil spirits will try and hurt someone and will do this kind of thing. So I just wanted to clarify that point. I have a son who has had epilepsy, He's, has medication, that, and he takes his medication, and it's, it, it's helped him. I know of others that have this as well. So we can't confuse this. And this is not skeptic. Uh, the skeptics who say that don't understand. Sometimes uh, demons do terrible things to people to try and hurt them and destroy them. Not just that, but there's other things. And when you look in the New Testament, you see it. Um, so here's Jesus. 
And they come to him, and, they, and they're befuddled as to what's going on. And, and why couldn't the disciples deal with this demon-possessed uh, boy appropriately? And, and Jesus directly answers them, and he says this. He says, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So here we see Jesus, okay? The nature of the Lord Jesus Christ as sustainer and creator of the world. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, has the answers for all of the world's problems. Now, we had just come off of the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Where he had revealed to his three disciples his unveiled identity and, and in all of its glory. This man, this son of God, he walked on the water. He healed the sick. He restored sight to the blind. He fed four and five thousand with just a few loaves and fish. People, including his disciples, even after seeing all that he was doing and all that he had done, still had a difficult time believing. And he called everyone who was a witness to this failed exorcism, including his own disciples, a faithless generation. Sometimes it's really amazing to me how much we lack faith. You know, on a personal level, I've seen many different things in my life that testify to the glory, the reality, and the power of the living God. I've tasted it, and I've seen it. And I know, without a shadow of a doubt, the things that have been revealed in my Christian walk are supernaturally given. They're from the Lord. That the things that I've seen, the things that I've experienced, should, by all intents and purposes, make my trust in God absolutely bomb-proof. Yet I see, when I look back upon my life, I see seasons of my life where I've allowed doubt to creep in and I've given way to doubt. And rather than standing strongly and vibrantly in the power of the Holy Spirit, I find myself at times to be a spiritual weakling, barely able to stand. Maybe you can relate. It's a sad reality that Jesus can do mirac miraculous things in our lives where Everything seems to be going right, and we're dancing along on cloud nine. And in those seasons, it's, it's like we're living in this state of spiritual invincibility. But then out of the blue, out of the blue, God permits us to undergo trials and temptations and testing by our enemy. The blue skies cloud over and turn gray and violent storms blow upon our lives and buffet us. Where shortly before we felt invincible, now we feel vulnerable and it seems on the surface level that we are facing the evils of this world on our own. I don't know about you, but I, if I think we're honest with ourselves when we're, when we're looking at this, we can identify with these disciples who failed to see the demon that was tormenting this boy in the manner that Christ wished them to see it. They were unable to see this demon cast out of this young man. And Jesus words echo. Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? 
how long shall I put up with you? You know what's amazing? It's, it's amazing that these same disciples that were there, who had been sent out, they had been sent out in the authority of Jesus just a few chapters before. You see in Mark chapter 6, this same bunch that's sitting here now in this conundrum, they are the same bunch, if you recall in Mark 6, that were sent out by Jesus. He instructed them to leave without even provisions. No prepping. No provisions. To go from town to town as his ambassadors. Lest we forget what happened here, I think it would be good for us to reread Mark 6, 7-13. to I'm going to read that. Because this was, this is significant to what we're seeing here right now. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except for a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And in any, if any places will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Then they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is just a couple chapters before. And here they are, standing Wondering, why are we being defeated by this scenario here? What's going on? The disciples appeared to have great success in their last venture when they went out to minister. But the difference was that in Mark 6, they had been commissioned directly and sent out with the authority of Jesus, and they stepped out in that authority. They had such success, though, I think, that they began to think of themselves maybe more highly than they ought to. When you, when you see success, it's hard not to. As a human being, when things are going real well, and wow, I must be special. God must have something special on me that makes me above the rest, a cut above the rest. You see this in the scriptures as the disciples argued amongst themselves as to who was going to be greatest, right? This is human ego. You can imagine, they went out two by two and all these miracles were happening. People were getting healed. Demons were go leaving these people and all of a sudden, they come to this place. This guy brings his little boy and, and his little boy is suffering from this demon possession. and They can't do a thing. The success they had in their mission, I think, before... Might have got to their heads. Thinking that they were in the wheelhouse. After all, Jesus gave them authority. They were special. They were king's kids. Oh, faithless generation, Jesus called them. How long would he be with them? How long would he put up with their immaturity in understanding how it really works? When we become children of God and follow Jesus. My friends, we are not venturing out onto neutral ground. We have a very real enemy that seeks to, to kill, steal, and destroy. And it's not about whether we're going to confront the enemy on our journeys. It's a matter of when. And it's going to come at any time. It can happen at any time. And as disciples of Jesus, this lesson in Mark has been given us to, to us to teach us something about ourselves in our human nature. But also to teach us some, something about the authority that there is in the Lamb of God. You see, as humans, our propensity is, despite the good things that God has done, is to become doubters overconfident in our own abilities to handle our life scenarios. To handle incursions by the enemy. 
And this overconfidence in self is actually rooted in the evil of pride. And in the end, this pride actually leads us towards the trademark signature of all false teaching and false teachers. You see, our heart wanders that way. Unless God keeps that in check, we wander towards false teaching and false teachers. We have the propensity to become false teachers. Pastors who have been faithfully preaching the word of God can become false teachers in short order if they don't stay connected to the vine. Congregants can become false led because their emotions are stirred and they take their eyes off the word of God and they allow themselves to be captivated by the messages that are broadcast out in this world that are not of Christ but are of the world. Oh, people, we must be so very careful. This is why the scriptures say that we are to watch our life and doctrine closely. Peter wrote about false teachers who operate in this mode in his epistle in 2 Peter 2, 1 and 3, where it says, but there are also false prophets among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. People can become misled. Further to this, Peter identifies such men in verse 10 and 11 in the same chapter where he explains... This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. See, the state of heart... of a man who permits his own pride to run him becomes increasingly self-focused and self-confident in his own or her own abilities to keep things going in the right direction and to make understanding in the world, to understand the world. Our hearts by nature, friends, are just like the hearts of those original disciples, so prone to unbelief, even after God has done so much to reveal his identity to them. Seeds of doubt and flesh that so easily entangle are around the corner. Paul tells Timothy to carefully live out the calling that God gave him. Now, Timothy was called to be a pastor, but this applies to every single believer. This was written for every single believer because everybody in the body of Christ has a, a gift that God gives them. You're gifted in certain ways that other people aren't. You're a combination, a unique combination. God's made you that to be part of the body of Christ because the body has many different parts that all function together for the glory of the Lord. So Timothy is told by Paul, do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hand upon you, hands upon you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. My friends, we are called to watch our heart and not to be proud, but to be humble. Watch your heart, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in what is right. And push away from what is false. Because if you do this, 
you'll say both yourself and your hearers. Did you know your life is a song for the gospel? When people look at you, they're looking at the church. They're not just looking at Hillside Community Church or whatever church building is on the next hill in town. They're looking at the people in that building as the church. It's time for us to humble ourselves sometimes and not be overconfident in our own abilities to stay on the straight and narrow and our own abilities to do the right thing, to make the right choices, to make the right decisions. Because we're in enemy territory. And without the protection of God, I'm, I'm quite sure that all of us are toast. Because there's nothing in you that's going to stop an enemy incursion. The only thing that's going to stop the enemy, an enemy incursion is the precious blood of Christ. That's the only thing. Lest we forget, we're called, and each of us are called to a different place, but without the presence and power of God, we're nothing. And you know something? The beautiful thing is, is that the God, the creator of the whole world, the creator of the universe, wants you and I to participate with him. Just little me, just little you. He just wants us to walk with him. He's the one that, that is the powerful one. But we walk in step with him. And he desires for us to see the beauty of the things he sees as he saves, delivers, and heals people. Isn't that wonderful? What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful Savior we have. Jesus, what a wonderful Savior. Jesus, Messiah. So what has this got to do with the story in Mark 9? The truth is everything. Just like those original disciples, our fleshly hearts can wander very quickly towards spiritual apathy rather than diligence, lack of faith in God and self-sufficiency rather than dependence. The result of the doctrine of self-reliance taking root in the hearts of believers leads to false teaching and defeats on the battlefields that we face in this world. The primary teaching passage concerning our handling of spiritual conflicts that the modern day disciples of Jesus would inevitably find themselves in, us, right, is found just as it was in the days of the original church. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 12. This is the instruction. Finally, it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Notice how he says, finally. This is the, this is the bottom line, finally. This is it, people. When we are walking in this world, and we're not on neutral ground, we're in the spiritual war, finally, be strong. How? Not in yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We cannot afford to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Our calling is not to be strong in ourselves and our ability to handle things on our own. It is to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That is why when we fight our battles, we fight on our knees. Whether it's literally on our knees, in our, in our home, in the spare bedroom, or whether it's on our knees as we walk about the community, as we interact with people, as we work our job, 
The Bible calls us to pray without ceasing because our dependency is on Jesus Christ and him alone. He is the only one that can defeat the enemy that we face out there. He is the only one that can make the breakthroughs out there that need to be made so that people can be saved, delivered, and healed. There is nothing latent within the human being in and of himself or herself. It is power of Christ. I happen to be walking with him, and he happens to live in me. That is awesome. But any victory that is won is the power of Christ in me. It's a work of grace. It's true that like the original 12, we also see this whole thing uh, with 72 disciples that were sent out by Jesus as well. And they had the same kind of success as the 12 did. This is scriptural leading up to this place here. The authority and the power that was given to them to do work was done in the name of Jesus. It was authorized by Jesus. Paul gives instructions to the Romans where he says in Romans 12, 3, for by great By the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. So Jesus sent out these 72 disciples along in a separate incident from sending out the 12. In Luke 10, 17 to 20, talks about the 72 who went out And they had great success. But the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They're all excited. Because the demonic power is the power of the enemy. That's great. Thank you that they submit to, to us. This is what the 72 were saying. But how did Jesus respond to this? He said, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. See, that's the the difference. The natural propensity is to go, yeah, the demons submit to us. Jesus is like, hold on a second here. I've given you this authority that the authority is, is, is specifically to set the captives free to populate the kingdom of heaven. And you, in fact, are one of those people that has been set free by the power of darkness. By the power of darkness that was in you, Jesus Christ has set you free and liberated you from that power and has given you the light of life. You are now a child of the king, and your residency for all of eternity is in heavenly places. Isn't that a a great promise? And this is why the scripture says that no weapon formed against us will prosper. It's not going to prosper as long as we focus our, our attention on our Lord, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. So, what happened here with this boy who was possessed by the demon? They were overconfident. You see, these nine disciples of Christ were overconfident in their position. So, they, there's a lesson here in faith that Jesus wanted them to comprehend. So, they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus... It immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for one, the one who believes. 
Immediately, the father, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never to enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Some versions add in fasting. There's two different Greek texts that they've translated from one's older and one's newer. The, the newer one says prayer and fasting. The older one says prayer. But the issue is, the issue is prayer and fasting is submission to God. It's when you fast, you're saying, God, I can't do this. I, I, I cannot accomplish anything on my own. I need you. It's a, it's, a, it's a humbling of ourselves, recognition that it is nothing, there's nothing in us that we can change the circumstances that we find ourselves in. This is, this is the power of fasting. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a heart cry to God saying, God, I need you. Prayer, same thing. God wants us to pray without ceasing. So even, evidently, this uh, case of demon possession was too much for the disciples, although Jesus had give them, given them authority over the unclean spirits because their heart attitude was one of self-reliance and unbelief. And that's what Jesus told them. Jesus came to, then the disciples came to Jesus in private. It says in verse 19, and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Pardon me, that was Matthew 19, 19, or 17, 19, and 20, which is the parallel text to our, our text here in Mark. So faith, Mark mentions what we read, that this kind can only come out by prayer. In Matthew, the focus is on the fact that the disciples had such little faith. See, they, didn't, they weren't connecting. They weren't believing. And that's why Jesus said, oh, faithless generation. So, this miracle showcases how the power resident within Jesus is capable of of bringing those who are left for dead by the enemy. You notice how the enemy threw him down and he looked like a corpse? The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to kill people. This miracle showcases how um, this little boy who was captive to the demon, he represents men and women who are bound and under the captivity of sin. The miracle is that even though our sins be a scarlet, even though we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, the life-giving Messiah sets us free from the power of sin and of death and is capable of bringing those who are left for dead by the enemy back to life. Jesus reached out and took the little boy's hand and he helped him and he got up and he was completely well. Jesus reaches to us in our state of deadness. And he grabs us by the hand and he pulls us up. And we are made whole. This is the power of the gospel. They, they didn't really understand totally. We look back on this now and we have this connection point. They didn't understand at the time. But as they left that place in Galilee, Jesus wanted to spend some time with his disciples alone because it was important for them to start drawing the connection of where this was all leading. It was all leading to the cross, my friends. They left, it says in verse 30, and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, 
the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. Jesus would continue to reinforce this, this specific thought. And where it actually led to was to the Last Supper. 